Yeah? Okay. So let us continue our discussion about computation of Nash equilibrium. And uh, let me recap what we did in the previous class very quickly. So the first thing we said was, well, we wanted to characterize Nash equilibrium. And uh, of course, one of the ways of uh, characterization is through the equilibrium definition of Nash. But there are other ways to characterize Nash equilibrium. And the w first method we studied was P star Q star is a Nash equilibrium if and only if P star Q star is fully labeled. Okay, so that was the first uh, uh, topic that we studied uh, in the previous class. And what we had mentioned was uh, this lemke hausen algorithm, it jumps from one point to another point, trying to find a fully labeled point. Okay, and if it can find a fully labeled point by jumping around in the set, uh, and if it can check for fully labeled easily, you can compute the Nash equilibrium. But of course, the problem was that while you are jumping around, there is no clear algorithm that you can use to jump around and figure out which direction you should jump towards so as to find a fully labeled point. Okay, so in, in essence, you have to really go through a lot of uh, different paths and cycles in order to figure out whether you have a fully labeled point or not. Okay, so that's why lemke hausen algorithm is not efficient in finding a Nash equilibrium of any arbitrary bimatrix game. The second characterization we studied was I define Z to be P, com P and Q stacked together as a vector. This is in delta M cross delta N. And Z star, and the theorem was Z star is a Nash equilibrium if and only if there exists an S in R such that Z transpose Q Z is greater than or equal to S. Well, let me make it Z star. And then S is greater than or equal to Bj transpose Ai Z star for every I and J. Okay, this was the second. What is Q, by the way? Q was, so C is A plus P, and Q is half 0, C, C transpose 0. Okay, and Q is neither positive definite nor negative definite. Okay, it's a symmetric matrix, but it's not, uh, its eigenvalues could be both positive and negative. Okay. In fact, if you think about this matrix Q, the trace of this matrix is equal to 0. So the sum of eigenvalues is equal to 0. So if there is a positive eigenvalue, there has to be a negative eigenvalue as well. Okay. So the trace is equal to 0. Okay. So the idea is, I mean, so, so, and we also said that, well, if you have the, the third thing we studied, which was not a characterization of Nash equilibrium, but the third thing we studied is if you can appro approximate this matrix C, then you can also get an approximate Nash equilibrium of the original game by, uh, by computing a Nash equilibrium of a new game that you formulate by, by approximating C. Okay, so we, uh, and what is, a, what is a, the best way of approximating a matrix C? Well, you use a lower rank approximation. And to get a lower rank approximation, you can use singular value decomposition, which we studied in the previous class. So if you think about it, we didn't really talk about a lot of ideas in the previous class, uh, except for some basic things about what happens uh, if you transform the matrices in some specific fashion. It was more of a linear algebra lecture than a game theory lecture. Okay, today is going to be more of an optimization lecture than a game theory lecture. Okay, so 
So the goal is, so goal for today's class, well, goal is find uh, an approximate meet N E using characterization number two. Okay? So we want to look at this equation pretty closely and try and come up with one algorithm that can compute an approximate Nash equilibrium. An approximate Nash equilibrium using that using that characterization. Okay? So let me formulate a, an optimization problem with an objective function that sort of resembles this inequality constraint and this as constraints. So the optimization problem is I want to minimize over S in R, Z in delta M cross delta N, S minus Z transpose QZ such that S is greater than or equal to BJ transpose AI Z for all I and J. If you think about it, there are M multiplied by N constraints. Let me make it capital M and capital N. Okay, so there are M N constraints and this is the objective function. Okay, and since, uh, so we have a lower bound on S, so this is, this lies in a compact set, so this, everything is bounded. So we have a lower bound on S, but we don't have an upper bound on S. So let's bound S by A plus B max, okay? And then if this becomes an optimization problem over a compact set. Okay, so this is an optimization, well, quadratic optimization. over a convex compact set. You know, but I write here quadratic, even though you know that Q is not positive definite. So it doesn't have any desirable property that you might otherwise expect from a quadratic optimization problem. Okay, so, so you have, your set might look something like this, but your function is something like this over this set. Wow, okay. I can draw good figures. Uh, so this is something I've learned over the past two years, okay, after I got this faculty position. Okay, I've started drawing good figures. Uh, so anyway, so this is, this is what the function looks like over this compact set, okay? So we want to somehow uh, come up with a method to solve this problem. So, one thing that we want to do, uh, one thing that is kind of obvious, if you want to solve a non-convex optimization problem like this, one way to do it is when you divide the region into smaller cells, and then what you try to do is find out what the value of the function is in this, in this cell, okay? And then figure out if, uh, if, uh, this is the maximum point or not, or a minimum point or not. Okay, so we are going to use some approach, something, some, an, an approach which is very similar to this. We'll try to reformulate this optimization problem over a different space, okay? And then we'll try and see whether we can get uh, the result using that, using that gridding technique, okay? The, the, but the first thing I want to introduce is an approximation so in this case, the approximation for equilibrium is done in a different fashion. So since you want to do gridding and you want to find an approximate minimum, I'm going to relax this optimization problem and the goal, the new goal, the new goal is find a feasible 
S, P, or S and yeah, S, P, Q such that S minus P transpose C Q is less than equal to 1 minus 1 over 1 plus epsilon square S. That's the new goal. By the way, one thing you can try at home is P transpose CQ is same as Z transpose QZ. Okay, they are not different. Okay. So, what do we know? We know that there always exists a Nash equilibrium. So, this problem will always have a feasible solution. You can always find an S that satisfies this set of inequalities, right? But in this, so what does that mean? The minimization of this uh, objective function will always be, the minimum value will always be less than or equal to zero, right? That's bound to happen because we know a solution to this exists, okay? It's bound to be less than or equal to zero. But here, what I'm saying is that I'm allowing this value, S minus P transpose CQ, to be less than or equal to something that is close to uh, close to 0 multiplied by s okay so this number so if you pick epsilon sufficiently small this number this multiplier number is close to 0 multiplied by s okay so depending upon what the sign of s is this number could be negative okay or it could be a very small positive number okay and both of them is fine right if you if you get a negative number you probably have satisfied these set of constraints because these constraints are going to be met, okay? This constraint is going to be met. If you find a value that is strictly negative, then that's fine, you have reached an Nash equilibrium, okay? But if you don't find something which is less than zero, if the minimum point is not less than zero, then it's fine because if S is positive, you can, you are very close to zero because your objective is overall objective is uh, very close to zero, okay? So that's the idea there. So you have relaxed the problem. Instead of finding a minimum point that is negative, you want to find a point that is less than or equal to some positive number. Okay. So that's idea number one. So I want to find an approximate Nash equilibrium which boils down to, so an exact Nash equilibrium will be a solution to this problem, but I want to find an approximate, so let's relax the condition. All I want to do is find a feasible SPQ, a tuple SPQ, such that this constraint is satisfied. Okay. Any questions so far? No? Okay, we keep reformulating this problem until we get to a point where we understand how to proceed. So C, which is equal to A plus B, can be written as DI UI VI transpose, right? I equals 1 to K. So C is of rank K. This matrix C is of rank K. And so I'm going to write C as a summation of I equals 1 to K. DI will be the element of the diagonal matrix in the singular value decomposition and ui is uh, the eigenvector of c c transpose vi is the eigenvector of c transpose c okay so let me absorb di in ui itself and just write it as ui vi transpose okay So what is P transpose CQ then? P transpose UI, PI transpose Q.
Okay. What does P transpose UI lie in? So P transpose UI, what does it stay in? This what is the set? Well this is UI min and UI max. Right? Same thing with uh, VI transpose Q. VI transpose Q will lie in VI min. So that's the minimum element of this vector VI and VI max. That's the maximum element of the vector VI. Same thing here. UI min is the minimum value in this vector UI and UI max is the maximum value of the vector UI. Okay, and this is for all I in K. I, so this is I equals one all the way up to K. So let us now formulate. So what we are going to do, what the idea of the, uh, of this paper that I'm presenting is Let's grid this part, okay? So instead of doing the gridding for the original delta M and delta N space and try to solve this problem, I don't want to do that. But this, we can do this gridding, okay? Gridding of this. So what I'm going to do is, this is my delta M multiplied by U delta m transpose u so that's my this space and this is delta n transpose vi oh no ui vi and there are i such i such grids and my set is going to look something like this in this space so let's uh, let's come up with some gridding mechanism so i'm going to write it as so i'm going to write ui min and ui max i will write it as alpha i alpha i 1 plus epsilon let me write it as a union union j equals not j i j are used l l equals 1 to some value capital L, alpha i, alpha i, 1 plus epsilon, okay? With alpha 2 equals alpha 1, 1 plus epsilon, alpha 3 equals alpha 2, 1 plus epsilon, alpha 1, 1 plus epsilon square, and so on. Alpha L? Uh, alpha L, yeah, that's right. Okay, same thing I'll do for VI min and VI max. Union L equals one to L2, well L1, L2, no, L, L alpha and L beta of beta L and beta L 1 plus epsilon. Okay, so it's not uniform gridding. Okay, one thing you should notice is that this is not uniform gridding. So the grids would look something like this. If this is your space, the first one is going to be finer, the second one is going to be more wider, third one is going to be much more wider, and the fourth one will be very wide. Okay, so this is the way you, we are gridding it. Same thing along the other direction. So this is my alpha. This is my alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5, and same thing here. Okay, so this is my beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and so on. And this, this gridding has to be done along all those i equals 1 to k. Okay, so you can imagine the number of the combinatorial explosion that you have now.
because the number of boxes that you have created is very, very high uh, in this case. By pick, but of course, epsilon is a free parameter, so you can pick whatever large value of epsilon you want in order to make the grid coarser and coarser and get a worse approximation of the original problem. Do we like to fix L alpha across i? Like for each i, do we have zero? Well, you see alpha 1, OK. I haven't defined what alpha 1 is, but alpha 1 is supposed to be u i min, right? And then alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4 all gets decided. No, I think it will be different. Because see, the grid is defined by this parameter epsilon, right? So what you want is ui max should be less than alpha 1, 1 plus epsilon L alpha. Yeah, so I, I guess I should write it as i or something, but I don't want to put too many subscripts. Yeah, yeah. So epsilon is the fixed quantity, OK? Everything else gets decided purely by epsilon. In fact, UIVI transpose, this is also fixed because that comes from the singular value decomposition of the matrix C. Okay, so now we have done the gridding. Let's take the next step. So whenever you pick a grid, so you have picked some alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha k, beta 1, beta 2, beta k, right? So let's say you are looking at this particular grid. Then you are saying that P transpose CQ, which is equal to summation of P transpose UI, VI transpose Q, i equals 1 to k is less than equal to. So what I'm doing is I'm restricting my attention to exactly this cell, OK? Because I've done the gridding in that fashion. So this is less than equal to alpha transpose beta um, You know what, I think uh, I need to put more subscripts, OK? Uh, this is my P transpose UI. This is my Q transpose VI axis, OK? So let me rewrite it as alpha I, and let me rewrite it as beta i. Okay, so this is the this corner of the grid that I'm considering, and this is the alpha i one plus epsilon and beta i one plus epsilon. So this is okay. So now I've I've renamed the renamed the value. So this so alpha i what I write alpha i here is not this alpha i but it is corresponding to this axis ui, OK? So that, yeah. So maybe I should write it as li. OK, too, too, too many i's and j's. So anyways, this is, this is my summation of alpha i, beta i, 1 plus epsilon square i equals 1 to k, which is the same as 1 plus epsilon square alpha transpose beta. And you can also do the same thing to say that p transpose cq is greater than or equal to alpha transpose beta. OK? And we also note. 
in the cell alpha i well containing p star transpose u i and q star transpose v i and this is for all i we have alpha transpose beta is less than equal to s less than equal to 1 plus epsilon square alpha transpose beta okay so only now s has entered the picture so we want to find a feasible vector spq that satisfies those constraints and you see that in so you are going to check for a feasible vector in each of these cells okay and then you will pick that particular cell in which s lies in between these two these two bounds so how do you write it in an algorithmic fashion so you want to minimize s comma p comma q and i'm go going to put a dummy uh, dummy objective function so let me put minus alpha transpose beta okay it doesn't depend so if you can see the the objective function doesn't depend on s doesn't depend on p doesn't depend on q okay so it's a dummy objective function because all i want to find is a feasible vector alpha i is less than equal to p transpose u i less than equal to alpha i 1 plus epsilon beta i less than equal to q transpose v i less than equal to beta i 1 plus epsilon these are the two uh, set of constraints and then i want s to be greater than equal to bj transpose a i p q prol i comma j so we have 2k inequality constraints we have 2k inequality constraints and we have m multiplied by n inequality constraints okay so that's the approximation algorithm so so what did we exactly do in this case we started with an optimization problem we knew that that optimization problem is non convex it's very hard to solve so so we relax the optimization problem into a feasibility problem all we want to do is find a feasible point spq that satisfies some condition that's good but then how do you how do you find that point so the idea was the key idea here was to actually grid the space but which space should you grid well look at the, look at this matrix c write it in the in the uh, in this form okay so sum, summation of a vector multiplied by a vector transpose form which is which can come from singular value decomposition and then if you look at p transpose cq it turns out to be of this form so instead of gridding the original space p and q you instead now grid p transpose ui space and vi transpose q space okay whatever this space looks like okay and so you grid it according to this fashion so initially the grids are smaller later on the grids become larger and larger right the width becomes larger and larger because of this uh, multiplying effect and then you note that all we want to find is an s that satisfy this constraint okay but s also has to satisfy this constraint okay so what that means is i will start with the smallest this lowest cell this cell i will try to solve this optimization problem okay i get a value of p star i get a value of q star i get a value of s star then i check if this condition is satisfied or not note that nowhere in this optimization have i put this constraint okay so i have to check whether these constraints are satisfied whether this equation holds true it doesn't hold true okay now i have to change the grid so i'll consider this grid okay again i'll try to solve this problem i get a value of s star 
I plug the value of S star here. Does it satisfy this inequality? No, it doesn't satisfy this inequality. OK, let's go and look at another grid, OK, and so on. OK, you keep looking for a feasible solution. Once you find a feasible solution, you plug it in here, see if this inequality is met or not. If it, does, if it has not met that inequality, you change the grid and go back and solve that problem again. OK, so that's the overall algorithm. And of course, you can see if you pick a smaller value of alpha, the grid is going to be finer and finer, and you will have to check too many solutions. Right? So the, uh, the, there is a tension between you looking for the best possible, alf best possible approximation by picking a small value of epsilon, or you pick a larger value of epsilon and let your solution to be a bit, bit worse than what you would otherwise get at the expense of computational complexity. OK, any question? Yeah. I don't understand why this method is better than the chaos method. Like, I mean, the original problem, you have a quadratic constraint, right. quadratic objective. Right. And then we could have just made the grid and the original problem and then find the uh, solution. Well, yes, you can do that also. I mean, this looks much better than this time. Because in this problem, we have the first grid, like the, uh, the P and Q. Right. And then for each point in the grid, we solve an optimization problem. Correct. Which might, looks like it takes, takes much time. Uh, yeah, so, well, you know, what you can also argue is that you have this original optimization problem. It's over a compact set. Why not just run gradient descent and see what we get? Right? That's also an option. The original problem? The original problem, even though it's a non-convex problem. Yeah, but yeah, we can get like a stuck. So in there are mon many ways, yes. So this is just one way that the authors have used to solve this problem. They are not saying that this is the best method. Okay. okay so what's the motivation for it? Well, this is what they have, they have proposed. This is what... Uh, uh, so the motivation, of course, is to find an epsilon Nash as efficiently as possible. Okay? What they did was they proposed this algorithm for whatever reason, okay? and you could come up with your own algorithm and write a paper about it. Okay? So, so I don't quite know why this algorithm would be any better than other algorithms because a comparative study has not been done so far. Okay? So there are many algorithms. In fact, this is one algorithm to find an epsilon Nash, well, not an epsilon Nash, but something that is close to, that gives you an object, that gives you an expected cost that is close to the expected cost of the original, if you had played according to Nash equilibrium. Okay, so this will give you a solution, which will give you an expected cost that is close to the expected cost as, at Nash equilibrium. Now, we'll study two more algorithms that give you epsilon Nash equilibrium, Okay, and nobody has done a comparative study of which algorithm works best under which condition. Okay, now let's say, so the, okay, so the other two algorithms that I'll talk about does not really consider the rank of the matrix C, okay, as such. This one says, well, if your rank is only two, let's say your C was of rank two or rank three, then the number of grids is very small. But in the other algorithms that I've yet to introduce, you essentially search for the entire space, delta m cross delta n. Okay? Whereas in this case, you're not, you might just be looking at R2 or R3 or R4, grids in R2, R3, R4, which might be much easier to solve than the original problem. In fact, yes, I remember the reason why this algorithm, the the condition under which this algorithm will work better is when k is much, much less than m and n. So you have a large game, but the rank of the overall a plus b is very, very small as compared to the number of actions players have in the original game. But you are right in pointing out that there is this optimization problem that needs to be solved. It has multiple inequality constraints. So you have to look at it in a holistic fashion. How much effort goes into solving this optimization problem, or rather a feasibility problem, and how much effort goes into 
coming up with this grid and solving that feasibility problem given a specific value of epsilon. Okay. The worst possible runtime is to search every grid. Yeah. In the worst case, you will have to search every every uh, every cell of the grid. And what else? Yeah. Yeah, but you have to see if, if, if it was rank one, for instance, then this is just a two-dimensional grid, very easy. But if it was rank two, then it's a four-dimensional grid. Well, yeah, a grid of this type, which is for k equals one, and then a similar grid for k equals two, right? And so on. So you have to do all the combinations. So this and this, this, this and this, this and this, this one and this one. Right, and so the combinatorial explosion will. Sorry. Exponential. Yeah. Well, you have to be careful when you say exponential because it all depends on what the value of epsilon you pick. So it should be probably one over epsilon square or something. The. Or one over epsilon raised to k. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, why do we do like the non-unity grid? Why don't Why don't we just do a unity grid? So all you are looking for. So th yes. So that's a good point. You see, remember when I introduced the the optimization. Remember what I had written was s minus z transpose q z is less than equal to one minus one over epsilon square multiplied by s, right? If I had made it, so instead of this, if I had written something that is not a multiplying, some number multiplied by s, if I had written something like 0 0.1 or maybe even epsilon, okay, for some positive epsilon, then I can't do a gridding of this type, okay? Then I'll have to make sure that the grid is very, very fine so that I do not miss any point that can satisfy this constraint. So this is actually a very good, very neat trick uh, for reducing the number of grids is to have <coughs> this, the non-optimality as some multiple of s rather than a fixed value that you pick, okay, some delta or epsilon or whatever. Okay, so that's a trick that the authors have used for getting this non-uniform grid. Okay, any other question? Okay. Okay, so this was a method for finding an approximate Nash equilibrium for a matrix C that might have a rank much, much lower than uh, the original game. Uh, the computational complexity of this method, I, I, I don't think I have read it, but this paper is somewhat old, written in 2006 or seven. So maybe somebody would have done some study since then, but I haven't seen it. Uh, so let's, Let's move on to the next algorithm, which, so the next algorithm is the case where C is rank one, okay? So that's the next algorithm for rank one games. Okay, so rank one games. And I want to make a disclaimer here. Some people would call rank one game, ga some people would call a game is rank one if A and B are matrices of rank one. Okay, but in this particular paper, they say that a game is rank one if C equals A plus B is rank one. Okay. So, uh, of course, if A is rank one and B is rank one, 
then C may be rank 2. Okay? So it need not be rank 1. So there is some slight difference in the way different papers define it. So in this case, when I say rank 1 game, I, ex I specifically mean that C is equal to UV transpose. Okay? So C is rank 1, not A and B. Okay, so rank one is, if you think about rank one game, zero sum game is, sits inside rank one game. So this is, this is rank one game, this is zero sum game, and then you have rank two games, and so on. Okay, rank k games. So for rank k game, this is the approximate method. Now, zero sum game, we know linear programming. So, for rank one game, I'm going to give you an exact algorithm. Okay, so this is for zero sum game, linear programming gives you the exact algorithm for computing Nash equilibrium. For rank one game, this paper was published in 2010. Uh, so, they give the exact algorithm for computing Nash equilibrium. For everything else, it's an open problem. Okay, rank two, rank three, it's, it's all an open problem. What about rank 1 plus epsilon? Okay, so there is some, what happens when C equals U, U1, V1 transpose plus epsilon, U2, V2 transpose. I don't know what the, I, I don't think I've seen any paper that solves this problem, okay, which is just a slight variation of rank 1 game. So who knows, maybe some of you can take a look at it in the final year of your PhD. When failures are fine, okay, you, you can afford to fail in the final year of your PhD in your research. Okay. And I also want to mention that in this particular algorithm, we compute stable. Nash equilibrium. So this is a refinement of Nash equilibrium. You don't compute any Nash equilibrium, you compute a stable Nash equilibrium of this particular game. So let me recall the Lemke-Hausen method, Hausen optimization problem. So the optimization problem is, this is an exact method, max over, or arg max, over p, q, pi 1, pi 2, p transpose, c, q. These are all payoff matrices, by the way. A and B are payoff matrices. So p transpose, c, q, minus pi 1, minus pi 2, a, q is, less than equal to, is it less than equal to? Less than equal to pi 1, 1 m, b transpose p is less than equal to pi 2, 1 n. Okay? So this is the exact method for arbitrary problem, for arbitrary matrix A, B, and your P star, Q star. So that is the Nash equilibrium, okay? If you can solve it for arbitrary matrix A and B, then it gives you the Nash equilibrium. But now we are making an assumption that A plus B is equal to UB transpose. So let's look at this part, and let's look at this part. So what do I have? So if C equals U B transpose, this implies B equals minus A plus U B transpose. Okay, so we'll substitute that in this expression. So what I have is arg max of P transpose U B transpose Q minus pi 1, minus pi 2, 
AQ less than or equal to pi 1, 1 m and B transpose P. So what is B transpose P? That's minus A transpose P and then plus U. No. B transpose U. Sorry, B U transpose, yeah. B U transpose P is less than or equal to pi two one n. Okay? And I want you to focus on this variable. Okay, and let me define P transpose U equals to lambda. So what would lambda be in u min u max, right? For any value p, since p is in simplex, it consists of a probability vector, any p transpose u will actually be in u min and u max, okay? It will lie in this interval, okay? Now here is the trick, okay? Here is the trick. Let me assume that I pick a value of lambda. Somebody told me a value of lambda which was equal to P star transpose U. Okay, somebody told me the value of lambda. Okay, that was P star transpose U. If I substitute it in the original optimization expression, what I have is lambda star, let me call it lambda star, lambda star multiplied by V transpose Q and in this place I will have minus A transpose P plus lambda star transpose V is less than or equal to pi 2, 1 n. What would the solution to this problem be? Remember that this is uh, linear in Q, linear in Q, linear in P, right? What would the solution be? Sorry? Yeah, it's a linear program. You know, you can solve this linear program. And in fact, the solution is actually going to be the Nash equilibrium, okay? If I give you the value of P star transpose U, which is a scalar, if I give you this value and you plug it in here, wherever you see U transpose P, you plug the value of lambda star there, and if you solve this problem, you exactly get the Nash equilibrium, okay, for this rank one game. Does that ring a bell? Can we come up? So this is the observation. This is the key observation here for rank one game. Can we come up with an algorithm? What, what would that algorithm try to do? That algorithm will try to find this value of lambda star because I know that if I, if I can estimate the value of lambda star very well, I can plug it in here. If I solve this, I get the original the Nash equilibrium for the original problem. So here is what the authors propose, and it actually seems to work because I implemented it on MATLAB. Uh, so here is the algorithm. So you initialize k equals zero, a k or whatever, well k equals 1, a 1 equals u min, b 1 equals u max, okay, and then for each k 
greater than equal to 1, you define lambda k as a k plus b k over 2 yeah and then i find or rather compute lp at lambda k which is arg max of well this would be pk star qk star equals arg max over p comma q and of course pi 1 and pi 2 of lambda k v transpose q minus pi 1 minus pi 2 a q less than equal to pi 1 and minus a transpose p plus lambda k v is less than equal to pi 2. Okay. Now, what should be the step three? So, this is my step one. This is my step two. Step three need to update. Yeah, update lambda k. So, how should we update lambda k? So, here is the idea. So I know that this is my u max, this is my u min. I can compute the u min and u max by looking at this vector mu. And I know that lambda star sits somewhere here. Let's say this is my lambda star, which is equal to u transpose p star. Okay, and I need to get to this point. I need to find this point. So in the first iteration, I picked this as my lambda 1, okay, and I computed p1 star and q1 star by solving this linear programming problem. What would happen? Okay, so I will look at, so, so at step 3, if lambda k equals to u transpose p k star, then p k star q k star is Nash equilibrium. Okay, so if your lambda k is such that it's equal to u transpose p k star, then you are standing at the Nash equilibrium. Why is that? Because if you pick, so lambda k is equal to u transpose p k star, you solve this, you get exactly the same p k star, so it has to be the Nash equilibrium. Now, if lambda k is greater than u transpose p k star, so um, Yeah, if lambda k was greater than u transpose p k star, this is the upper limit b1, well, I'll just write it, then b k plus 1 should be updated as lambda k plus b k over 2. So I found that this is where my u transpose p k star is. and Remember initially, let's say p1 star is, remember this one was my a1, this is my a2, sorry, b, b1. So I need to get these boundaries closer, okay? I need to get, I need to push a1 on this side and b1 on this side. So
So how would I do that? So I will update my bk plus 1 in this fashion. On the other hand, if lambda k was less than u transpose pk star, then a k plus 1 equals lambda k plus a k over 2 and go to step 2. Okay, and if you look at this, if you plot the graph of a k and b k with k, a k will go like this, b k will go like this, and eventually they will converge. Lambda k will be somewhere in between. This will be your lambda k because that's the average of a k and b k. This will be your a k. It's monotonically increasing and this will be your BK, monotonically decreasing. Okay, and this is the bisection method, right? This is the bisection method of finding uh, some sort of fixed point equation. So they were able to map the original problem to a bisection problem over a real line, over an interval of real line. So this is not even the entire real line. So this is an interval between U min and U max and they parameterize the original linear programming by this, this scalar lambda k that lies in this particular compact set, in this particular interval. And so if you run this algorithm, eventually these two a k's and b k's will converge, which means lambda k will converge, and it actually converges to lambda star, which is p transpose u, p star transpose u. Okay, so that's the that's this algorithm uh, for rank one. So this is an exact algorithm for rank one games. It runs in polynomial time. It's very fast, and all it requires at every step is to solve a linear program, which runs pretty fast in most machines nowadays. I but I I do have to note that I've seen some numerical instability in this kind of uh, in this particular algorithm. So what I did. So this is what they have proposed in the paper, okay? But because there was numerical instability, what I did was I put a minimum. No, this is uh, what did I do? Yeah. Oh, I forgot what I did. Oh no, I I remember. This is U transpose P K star. So that's maximum. And in this case, I define a k plus 1 as min of this and u transpose p k star. OK, min of these two values and max of these two values. And this seems to get around the numerical instability problem. I don't quite know why I'm seeing numerical instability. Uh, sometimes this optimization problem doesn't converge in a finite number of steps. I don't know. I, I, I really cannot get my head around how to get rid of that stability, uh, stability issue. But this seems to work fine in my implementation, in my MATLAB implementation. We're using the default LP. Yeah, default LP solver. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't? Yeah. It takes too many iterations yeah, it takes to many solve. Iterations and it's also not accurate if you get too large of like a Okay. Yeah. So I think it's the dual Yeah, so this this sort of got me around the problem. Really the issue was I'll tell you what the issue was. I, I figured out what the issue was after spending several hours, which wasn't good. Uh, uh, the issue was this. Okay, let's say this is your this is your lambda 1 and this is your lambda star lambda star okay sometimes the algorithm updated in such a manner that my ak was here and my bk was here so lambda star went out of the range of ak and bk the interval ak bk okay and then then everything all hell broke loose kind of 
situation happened and I don't know what happened. MATLAB behaved in whatever way it behaved. Okay, so what I wanted to do was always make sure that AK is always below lambda star and BK is always above lambda star and by taking this maximum and this minimum here, I get around that difficulty. Okay. So that was, uh, that was quite a nice algorithm, nice observation uh, for rank one games. But for rank two games, rank three games, it's still an open problem, okay? That we don't know how to solve those classes of games. But for a general game, I will start, I'll talk about two algorithms in the next class where we'll see how to solve Nash equilibrium, how to get a Nash equilibrium for those games. And there, you do what you suggested, okay? You sample points from this delta M and delta N in a specific fashion, okay? So we'll talk about how to sample those points. And then you check for epsilon Nash condition. And there is a very nice way of proving that such a point exists. Okay, the way you sample it, uh, it's a very specific way you sample it, so it's not clear whether an epsilon Nash exists within that sample point, within the set of sample points or not. But it so turns out that an epsilon Nash would exist and you will just go over each of those points and try to solve a problem and get an epsilon Nash. And Joe had ran that, that algorithm uh, a year ago, now he's older. Uh, so he ran this algorithm and it took 16 hours for a reasonable 10 cross 10 game. Sometimes. Okay, sorry? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it was 10 hours, sometimes it was 5 hours, sometimes it was 10 minutes. Okay, so, uh, but it's still, it's said to be a polynomial time algorithm, but polynomial time doesn't mean it won't take 16 hours, okay? <laughs> so, so, so we'll introduce two such algorithms in the next class uh, for finding epsilon Nash. Okay, where we sample from the original strategy space itself, or mixed, mixed strategy space itself. Okay, thank you, I'll see you guys on Monday, uh, on Tuesday.